Hi everybody, this is Leah Martin. Thank you once again for coming back and listening to a very special episode that I have with Nicholas Bevero from Penn Brothers. Now, Penn Brothers is, and we've been talking, uh, I've been talking with Nick over uh, the last 20 or 30 minutes. We had some internet issues, which was interesting, but he's actually in Makati, Philippines right now. In BGC actually uh, right now. In BGC, you're in BGC. And I'm in Montreal, so obviously, communicating on opposite sides of the planet sometimes comes with uh, some difficulties. But I'm really excited to be able to chat about his concept for Penn Brothers and where he is essentially talking about where the BPO industry is going and what he th theoretically thinks needs to change inside of that industry for everyone to be able to level up. So Nicholas, really appreciate you jumping on. First question that I have for you is, Penn Brothers, you have a co-founder that I'm pretty sure is not your brother. <laughs> Why did you call the company Penn Brothers? Well, th thank you very much for that question. And first of all, thank you very much for having me. Um, mm -hmm. It started, so we have been friends. My co-founder and I have been friends for about 20 years. We met in Japan. We were both living and working in Japan. And um, we both, in 2011, moved in different countries. He moved to China. I moved to the Philippines um, for my Japanese employer at that time. And then in 2014, when we were playing around with the idea of setting up Penn Brothers and the, com the company itself, we were playing around with names um, and had a, a few creative names. But to be very, very transparent, originally our first business idea was a gin bar. Um, and we already had the <laughs> name for the gin bar. I do like gin. Yeah, we, bo we both liked gin at that time. I mean, he's Portuguese mm -hmm. and gin is a huge business in Portugal and a, a huge... Um, fan bases and so our idea was to a gin bar and we had the name and the logo it was supposed to be called canela cinnamon in spanish or in portuguese also and, and had a logo and then so but you still needed to incorporate a company in the philippines and we played around with ideas and said like oh why don't for for the sake of fun of it why don't we use pen brothers or pen something brothers or something brothers okay. and then we played with ideas a bunch of ideas didn't get accepted by our lawyers because they were either too too not acceptable, let's call it with that. And then we ended up calling it, uh, I think, Pen Brothers, kind of like uh, pen friendship, pen pulse, kind of, uh, different things. It, it doesn't really have too much meaning, um, but um, it was not supposed to be the brand name. The brand name was Canela, but then when we s decided that neither of us had <laughs> knowledge of uh, how to run a bar, uh, nor did we want to spend long nights in a bar and uh, dealing with, I guess, uh, alcoholized uh, customers. Uh, we decided to c cancel the bar idea. And then he was actually at that time in a different startup. He was looking for people. And then the whole idea came up. OK, why don't we try to find really good people in the Philippines for you? Um, and then we took out the company, which we already had established and said, well, let's do it with this. And then the name stayed. Um, uh, it's a, it's it's that's the real that's the story of of the name Pen Brothers. So the the actual Pen Brothers doesn't have much meaning in that sense. It was more of playing around okay. with names. Yeah. That's pretty funny to go from a gin bar gin bar to a BPO. Um, never heard that one before. Yeah, yeah. Always new information on this podcast. Uh, so <clears throat> you're primarily located in Manila, is that correct? Correct. Yes. Or are you, okay, and so. You're hiring exclusively, from what I've read on your website, hiring exclusively Filipino talent, specifically serving the world. Um, why aren't you expanding out to different countries? Is it that you really want to be able to double down on the Filipino talent base? Or is there something else there that I'm not picking up on? No, I, it's, it's, it's actually that. I believe that the Filipino talent base is very, very large. And um, it's a very young population. There's a lot of um, young people coming out of colleges, um, entering the labor force, uh, also being trained on working for other companies. So there is still such a big opportunity in working with Filipinos and, and de building, still working and building it up in the Philippines. Um, and I guess like any other company, there's always the also a problem or a challenge of of what you focus on, how many things you can do at the same time. Um, so obviously you could also decide, you know, it works in the Philippines, let's do it also in other countries. And the, the idea has crossed our mind, uh, absolutely. But there's also, it always comes with challenges. I mean, resources are finite, uh, starting with your time, starting with the management resources, starting also with financial resources. So 
our decision has always been, well, do we do it in various locations um, and therefore have to sacrifice maybe on quality or have to sacrifice on certain other things? Or do we focus on the Philippines where there is, in our opinion, still a vast opportunity with the talent in the Philippines and the Filipinos itself and their quality and, and the nature of the Filipinos and try to do that as good as possible and provide the best service as possible both to our clients right. as well as to our employees. Uh, and so we went, we, we chose for the second path. Um, it's, it's, I guess, it's very easy to get excited and then to get overextended, at least in my opinion. I mean, I've seen that <clears throat> as probably a top three, and, and I will come up with, after I've done about 50 more of these, the top three reasons why uh, BPOs specifically fail. And expansion, expansion being too quick is probably top three. Just, they get over their skis, they think to themselves, hey, uh, this is, we're going to go and start up an office in Costa Rica, and we're going to start an office in India, and we're going to start an office in uh, somewhere else in South America. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> you have a P&L where you're just completely bleeding because you've set up all of these different entities and all of these different offices everywhere all over the world, and you can't actually um, figure out how to fill up those contracts, which is, uh, I've seen a lot of BPOs that have been fantastic that have gone south in that direction. With that, to that point, speaking to that point, are all of your team members in an office? Are you hybrid? Are you remote? How do you work your, um, uh, your general kind of labor agreements with regards to location? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. So we, we are nowadays, so pre COVID, we were actually, I would say 95% working from the office, like most companies okay. at the end of the day. And I think COVID changed that yeah. significantly and improved also the quality of, of, of at least the work life quality for a lot of our employees. So nowadays, a large part of our employees are actually working remotely. And within that setting, it can be different. So some clients are still having people in the office, some clients, um, or for some clients, we do a hybrid setup. Um, and the hybrid can be very different ways. It can be once a week, twice a week, it can be once a month, can be once a quarter, it really comes down to the need and preference. And then for other clients, honestly, it's fully remote, but um, with our HR and our teams doing a lot of work to create that, that, team, that team building capability and, and being part of Ben Brothers, right. um, because otherwise it can get very lonely very quickly. So we need to work very closely uh, from an HR BP perspective with our employees and, our, and, and, and together with our clients, obviously. Uh, specifically at this time of the year, I mean, Christmas is around the corner. And so Christmas is a very important um, yes. part of the whole team building and, and, and team environment. Yeah, mm, yeah no, it's uh, one of those things that if you've never had, if you've never experienced Christmas in the Philippines, <laughs> you should. I think it is the absolute nucleus of Christmas. Uh, everyone kind of, at least to me, around mid-December, it's really difficult to get anything done because you've just got to push with everybody because it's the Christmas parties and, you know, the the malls are amazing. It's it's really, really cool. Going, feeding off at that point, talking about the the impact that remote work had on your workforce, I want to talk about your operating model because... In our pre-interview, we were kind of throwing around the concept of saying, well, I don't think we're really a BPO, right? And you're a BPO for the purposes of this podcast, at least, <laughs> but maybe you can explain that a little bit. Like, what do you, how do you see yourselves in the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, I think the BPO itself is a, is obviously a, big universe and there is a big range of, of, of companies and models within the BPO. And so where we are trying and where we are focusing and I focused from the beginning and it starts with the founding story of our company where my co-founder Guy, when he was looking for talent, he was not looking for one specific type of talent, but he was looking for his own startup for a very wide range of talent. So he needed accountants, he needed IT people of different types. 
Um, he needed graphic designers, content editors. Um, he uh, needed salespeople, marketing people. So it was almost everything. And so at that time, okay. we looked at it and said, well, you know, the standard, my understanding, and I have to be very honest, this is my personal understanding from my work before, the standard BPO, obviously, usually it's very focused on specific roles and specific processes. But him being a startup, the processes weren't there. I mean, it was all very still being created, very flexible. You, today, you were going to be the marketing team doing this marketing project, but tomorrow you needed to do something, maybe help with content writing or help with something else. So that type right. of flexibility within the team was something which from the get-go we, we, we had to bring in. And so when we hired people, we also made it very clear, well, you're being hired not, very, not for a very specific process, which is already perfectly defined, but you're being hired to be part of the marketing team, but you need to get your hands dirty potentially in other things. And we realized very quickly that not only his company needed this, but other startups and other also even SMEs were actually looking for that type of more flexible talent, um, talent which, mm. which is more of an, of an offshore part of your core team than a specific outsource part of your, of your work. Um, sure. And so that that is a slightly different model than what my personal understanding of a BPO, and I might actually be unfair to some BPOs, but at least that's how I learned it when I started my career 20 years ago. Um, and so it's something which we have been replicating. And I we have seen quite a quite a good amount of demand, and not only from startups, but also even from bigger, more established companies who say, well, BPOs, they provide a very good service on a certain layer. So let's take customer service. So BPO can be very good on, let's say, the first level of customer service or maybe even a layer of estimation. But once it gets more and more escalated, you need people who are more flexible, who today can solve this problem and tomorrow can solve a different problem or who you can then move to try out a new product, for example, which you're, which you're starting to try with customers. Um, and that type of flexibility is not something I believe you can have that easily in a BPO because the processes are very defined and very clear. But with us, <clears throat> those people being an extension of your team, an offshore remote extension of your team, you can actually have that flexibility. Um, and that can be in customer support or that can be in accounting or that can be in IT. Um, so we have seen that that flexibility which we try to bring to the table for our clients is, has been very interesting for a lot of them. Um, and so I guess that's how I see us being a little bit different. But again, I, I, I don't know everybody. Um, so I'm assuming yeah. other BPOs who are almost flexible teams. Sorry. To almost pull kind of like uh, words out of your mouth there, I would almost kind of define you as some form of extreme staff leasing setup where it's like, we're going to provide just this massive infrastructure for you where I want to hire a customer support person one day. I want to hire an engineer the next day. There are very few BPOs that have that level of range to them. And it's interesting to be able to kind of see where that, it, and you also, I mean, we, we were talking about uh, this again before we jumped on for the call. You're really big on saying, I'm going to go like the Apple version of uh, the the BPO industry, <clears throat> meaning you don't want to compete on price. So you want to compete on quality. You don't want to compete on price. Yep. How do you see that in comparison to the rest of the industry? Because there are a lot of people in the industry that compete on price, right? Um, I, I don't really see many BPOs that compete on quality. And I, I'd love to hear your perspective. Like, you know, if you're, if you're competing with, let's say, two or three other perspective um, competitors, how do you structure yourself in comparison to what they're doing? And, and do you lose a lot of those contracts that you wouldn't have otherwise, um, but that you would have been able to get access to? Well, I think at the end of the day, using the analogy you used of, of Apple, um, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess when you take a step back in, in the case of Apple and, and the Apple phones, obviously they sell millions of phones, but that's small fraction of the overall global amount of phones being sold. Exactly. Me too. I, 
I buy a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. At the end of the day, and honestly, the people around me too. But if you take a step back, you you see that there is a lot of other phones. Even here in the Philippines, I I, I mean, Apple is definitely not the most sold phone in the Philippines. There are many other phones which are selling much larger volume. So I guess in a BPO and in the offshoring or or outsourcing industry is similar. You have different types of um, companies to serve a different type of market, and so um, in our case. Yes, not competing on price, but competing on quality is is obviously can be challenging. But I think it also can be very rewarding because you do build very interesting teams um, with your clients, and you do because you're not competing on on price. Our approach is a very consultative approach, so we spend a lot of time in our initial sales process, and then also later on as a when if we win the the contract uh, on the customer mm-hmm. success. Uh, management process, spending a lot of time with the clients to really help them um, understand, okay, what's the quality of the Philippine talents? How do we uh, find the right talent, which really fits your job description and the and the work you're trying to achieve? How do we develop this talent? How do we grow this talent? Or how do we develop the team then afterwards, if it's more than just one person? Um, so it's a, it's a more bespoke and maybe also therefore a smaller, a slower growth but I, I think it's a it's at least for me personally it's a very interesting type of, of of approach. It's less the volume approach. It's like not oh yeah sure let's hire a hundred people who do an exact process, um, mm-hmm. but let's hire you five really good different types of people and let's let's work together to find them. Let's work together to interview them. Let's work together to bring them in and make them really add value to you our customer. Uh, and, and it's a different, it's, it's more niche, it's a different market, but it doesn't mean that the market is not by itself very, very large. <laughs> I mean, the whole offshoring, outsourcing BPO industry is huge and growing gigantically. And I believe it's going to continue to grow. At least that's my personal opinion. <laughs> Would you say that post COVID, that type of customer is that a uh, total addressable market that's going that's going up or, or going up it is expanding faster than everyone else in the industry because it seems to me like this is almost kind of like a post covid type of mindset which is well we're going to run not a remote organization but we're hearing a lot of digital first mm-hmm. companies where we're just saying let's remove the whole concept of remote distributed all that kind of stuff we're talking about digital first which is It's ones and zeros fundamentally. And how do we actually find the best talent to be able to support the ones and zeros that is the output at the end of the day, right, inside of the organization? Did you see a bit of a shift pre-COVID versus post-COVID? Did that market kind of change in any way? I think... I think the overall BPO market and the overall outsourcing offshoring market is, is growing significantly. And I think COVID helped that okay. um, overall. And, and in our particular segment, definitely it did help because companies were forced to work remotely and to have their teams work remotely. And even in America and Canada, I mean, a lot of people then took the opportunity to move away from wherever they were. Um, living and move to the countryside or move back to where their families were from and whatnot. And so a lot of companies realized, oh, okay, so before they were all working uh, from Toronto, now they're all working from more remote areas or different bigger cities. If that works, that means that inherently my talent pool now is is much bigger. It's global. And so if, yes. if I can have a person now working who used to be with me, I'm using Toronto as an example, but let's say they used to be with me in Toronto. And now that person is for personal reasons working out of New York or working out of California. I can also have somebody working out of Australia or Philippines or India or anywhere at the end of the day and find really the best talent for the job opening I have. And so I think that's actually part of the reason why the, the, that, that segment of the industry and the industry overall is, is growing quite significantly. Um, and, and, mm-hmm. and companies are much more willing to give it a shot, to try it out, because before they weren't, they, they didn't do it. It was not part of, of what they were willing to try or even had considered, but because they had to do it during COVID, um, they're much more willing to try it out because they saw that it is, it is manageable, it works. Uh, it might not work perfectly for everything, but it works for a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's such an interesting 
direction that you're taking because when I think about that high touch, very intimate process with regards to the BPO industry, <clears throat> it probably is a pretty, it's an expanding market for sure. And just recognizing that that's historically been a very small slice of the overall pie. No, and I think so, historically you were maybe willing to do it to a point, but it was more what I think they called nearshoring. So you were doing it, but you were doing it closer to your base. Um, you were not necessarily willing to say, you know what, well, if I, let me look, <clears throat> let me think a little bit farther uh, outside, you know, let me go, let me go bigger at the end of the day. And, and, and I think the real challenge of companies has already been and it's, continue going, it's going to continue to be talent. At the end of the day, you can't really create a company, create a product and create a, a good service without the talent. And where do you find the talent and, and how do you find good talent and how do you retain the talent? It's going to be more and more and more front and center, in, 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 at least in my opinion. Um, and it might not be for every company, but again, there's a lot of companies and it's a big market out there. Yeah. So this brings me on to my next question here, which you might have five or six answers to. What counterintuitive advice would you give to other BPO founders to get to the type of scale that you're currently at right now. You're approximately 1,500 people. You want to be able to expand that, but obviously doing it in the way that you want to do it, which is this high touch, focusing on value, not necessarily on, on margin type of business. So what counterintuitive advice would you give to other BPO founders that want to follow in the type of businesses that you're running? Well, is it counterintuitive? I don't know, but I mean, I guess one of my personal advice would always be uh, listen to the clients and, and, li and listen, listen mm. to the customers and try to under and, and also the potential customers and try to understand what is it they actually want and what they're looking for and, and, and what challenges do they, are they having and, and how can you help them with those challenges? Um, Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Is there a difference between what they want and what they're looking for? Sometimes. Are those two things different? Sometimes. Because I find a lot of the times it's like, I want X, but you might be able to chat with someone over a half hour period and you're actually realizing they actually don't want X. They, they want X squared, right? They, <laughs> they don't want, they don't just want a support rep. They actually, they have a, they, they need a support rep because their engineers are horrible. And maybe you actually need to come out of that call saying, you need engineering talent. You don't just need a support person. Yep. Um, that, like, how does your sales process work, particularly if you're talking about building this very intimate connection between yourselves and and the client? Is this something that are you talking to them on like a monthly basis, a weekly basis? What what's the process look like there? Yeah, no, it's a good it's a good question, and and I think it happens more often than not that the 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 client has an idea of what he or she wants, and then right. when we go into a little bit more in depth and calibration, um, we realize well that's maybe slightly different uh, what you what you want, or maybe what you really need is to break down this role in in into two different uh, people. Um, so right. so that's that's actually it's actually quite interesting, and it, it happens more often more often than not. Um, and so we do spend a lot of time during the sales cycle. It's a consultative approach I mentioned at the beginning uh, to talk to the talk with the clients, try to really understand what the clients are looking for, uh, get a better understanding and handle on that. And then during uh, the onboarding of clients, we also uh, we have we have something we call hyper uh, care. So we really work very closely with every new client for the first three months so that we make sure any problem or misunderstanding or misalignment gets fixed immediately and that we okay. can also be the the hrbp the partner in the philippines between the client and the employee so that we can bridge this any gap there might be bridge it as quickly as possible because the faster the, 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 the faster they get both onboarded or the, 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 the faster the output will also be there, that, which at the end of the day, the client is looking for and paying for. Um, and then we have a regular cadence. I mean, we have invested very heavily over the last four years uh, or five years into our customer success management. So it's a, it's a and our HR team because um, 
You'd have to. They're different. To be able to do the yeah, yeah exactly. Really. Yeah, but I mean, I guess maybe that's one of the one of the um, recommendations. Is like, don't underestimate your customer success team and your HR team. You know, it's not just about hiring somebody and then throwing it at the customer. I mean, um, you need to do right. a lot of work there to make sure that the service is really being provided and that the customers are getting their money worth um, out of it. And but also that you gather the information from the employees, from the clients from the people, not the, man, the top management of the client, but the people who actually work with the employee inside the client and gather that information and are able to build something out of it or make recommendations out of it or go back to the client and say like, well, why don't we think about this solution or that solution? So it's a, it's a very consultative approach, which I personally actually like because it's challenging and not every client is the same and not, and not every situation is the same. And I believe that's more interesting also to my own employees um, who service the clients and the employees. Yeah, yeah very, very. Um, I got a couple, hold on one second here. My computer, for some reason, it looks like, not my computer, my, uh, my DSLR is freaking out. Yeah, you're uh, black on my side right now. Yeah, I know. I mean, I'm not you, but the, the Restarting that here. Yeah, yeah I'm going to see if I can get myself back up and running here um, and then I will go through our our quick questions all right <clears throat> that'll hopefully work I've pulled out the SD card which is usually quite hot oh, wow. uh, to be able to finish off so it's kind of like this is my emergency power system <laughs> kicking in where I get a little bit of extra I get an extra 10 minutes um, and we're at the end of the hour so <clears throat> I'll start it off from here so at the end of this, or no, what am I going to say? Don't worry. Questions. Take your time. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So a couple of cool questions before we end up at the top of the hour here. Um, I usually like to throw these fast questions at people. And I would ideally like you to tell me the answer that you first have, as opposed to the one that pops into your head and you say, oh, you can't, I can't tell Liam that one. That's the one that I'd really like to know. Um, <laughs> okay. All Good right. Enough. So what's the biggest mistake you made in your business? Uh, sometimes trusting the wrong people or hiring the wrong people. Mm. Mm. Uh, is that, and we don't want to kind of throw anyone necessarily under the bus. Maybe you can kind of uh, switch out some names or something like that. What's an example of something that pops up to the top of your head in terms of trust and how your trust was, was damaged um, through giving someone an opportunity that maybe you shouldn't have given them? Uh, there are two, two uh, without going into names, obviously. I mean, there are two examples. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the first one, I, I guess, which has happened a couple of times in my career is where you promote somebody too fast. Um, you, you know okay. that this person has real talent, real quality, um, and is, but you, you decide to promote that person into a certain role too early and too fast. And, you know, when a company is growing also, it's not always easy or, or, or possible to really coach and mentor uh, the way you, you maybe should uh, if you would have that capability right. in the time. And then unfortunately, those, those people, once, if they get promoted too fast, they, that they suffer. They, they suffer. They, they are overwhelmed by the challenge. And um, that has happened. It's very unfortunate because um, it's, it's, it's inherently my mistake um, mm. and not their, not their problem or not their mistake it's my mistake and that obviously makes it's something i i always try to learn from and and make sure that it doesn't happen again um it's not easy when you are specifically when you're a young startup and you you have a lean team um it's 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 very tempting to start promoting people or or, or double heading triple heading and that can actually be con counterproductive uh, at the end of the day and then there is right. the standard, and it's not even trust things. It's about, you know, hiring a person which you really thought was a good fit and then figuring out after a while that that person is not the best fit or that the person was a very good salesperson selling themselves but not being able to deliver what you expected. And then that happens, unfortunately, and um, it, 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 is, it comes with challenges. What's the biggest thing stopping you from getting to the next level? in your business? What's the next biggest barrier? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, that's why I ask it. 
because I have those questions. I think about that I guess, every week. I guess the Monday morning, I actually have these questions that I ask myself. I, I, uh, I guess prioritization, to be honest. Um, okay. It goes a little bit back to your question. Why didn't we also, sorry, my bad. I hit my table. Why didn't we go also no into, other, into other countries? Why didn't we also uh, do more? And I think it's always very tempted to do, tempting to do that. And, and even after we decided to stay in the Philippines, it's tempting to do a lot of different things um, and to add a lot of different belts and whistles. And I think the, what, what, what is the biggest challenge for us is to make sure we keep reminding ourselves what are the main priorities, what are the main three things that we're focusing on, and then drive those things until the next level and then maybe come up with the next three things but um it's always tempting and it's a human thing to say like oh we have those three things they're kind of working why don't we do now four five six and then before you know it it's too many things and you're juggling too many balls okay. uh and your teams are too busy with so many things that the original three suddenly become a, a deprioritized and then you get confused and you get stuck so i think that's something um, which has happened uh, a few times in, in my career and, and we keep reminding or I keep reminding myself and, and the team, guys, let's focus on our priorities. Let's make sure we do this. And once we have done this and we're 99% there, then we can start adding other things to it. Um, and we just went through a cycle like that, to be very honest. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, when you were saying that, what was going through my head was mission, vision, and values. Yeah. <clears throat> and we always think about what's the mission, what's our vision, and what are our values? How do we actually continue to make sure that that occurs? Yeah. And uh, it is a big one that everyone kind of thinks, let's go do the next big thing. But in reality, you haven't actually finished the sandwich that uh, that's at the table. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think the BPO industry needs to do differently? Um, huh. Well, um, that is another one which is very hard. Um, I guess to a degree, there are there is a component in the in the uh, when I talk to some of, of potential leads, potential clients, um, they try to figure out: Are you a BPO? Are you not a BPO? Because there isn't inherently some not not always, but there is sometimes a little bit of a negative connotation with BPOs. You know, I've I've had mm -hmm. people also that I met, and they're like, "Oh, we have done BPOs. We've done it in Philippines, or we've done it in India, or we've done it in other places, and it didn't work for us um, for X Y Z reasons." And I think there is a little bit of a bad reputation. It's it's almost a little bit like. Um, the, the the little the little um, chat thingies on the web pages, which also I think burned a lot of sure. people, and a lot of people are annoyed of them. And so I think we need to we need to maybe spend a little bit more time, maybe not rebranding, but re-explaining BPOs, and also showing that there is a real positive side also on BPOs, and it's and and the negative sides. Yeah, sometimes it doesn't work out, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't work, and it doesn't mean that it cannot really add value to you and to right. your company and your organization. Um, would be one take. Not sure if everybody agrees with me, but that would be one idea. I like that. I like that take. Uh, where do you see the future of work? Where do you think, and, and maybe actually let me be a little bit more specific about that. Where is Penn Brothers going to be in the next five years? Five years from now, paint the picture. Where is Penn Brothers? We want to become step-by-step step better in doing what we do. So that starts with becoming better in understanding what our potential clients really want and really need and really, really want to find in the talent they're looking for. Becoming better in finding that talent, uh, becoming better in really bringing the onboarding the clients and the talent and closing that gap between those two as quickly as possible in providing added value to the clients as well as to the employees um, in, for example, with learning and development, team building activities, um, other things which, which help both the client in, 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 their, in whatever they are trying and aspiring to do, building their product, building their customer support, building their back office support, whatever it is, but also with the employees itself. And, and then obviously also helping um, the employees 
to grow as humans and as professionals. Because at the end of the day, if we would hire somebody today and five years down the road, that person is still doing exactly the same job with exactly the same things, that, that's not a win. That's actually, that's, a, that's, a, that's bad. Um, that means right. that we did not develop this person as a professional and ideally also as a, as a human within society. So, so, that, so it's, it's about adding more to them um, and thereby adding to the clients. I mean, in, in, that's what we're aspired to achieve and to become better and better and better. I love that. Yeah, that's a, I love the perspective of if in five years they're doing the same job, then we failed. Yeah. That's actually a really good kind of, I, I'm trying to think about people in my company right now that have that same type of mindset. Yeah, and, and um, I can, I can give you an example. I mean, I have one employee. Um, sure. She started with us six, seven years ago. She was a customer support agent for an American startup. And then over time, we they obviously the startup did their contribution and their training. We did our training, our contribution. And then over time, she became the team leader. Over time, she had a team of about 40 people. And then um, the startup sold itself. So we took her on for our own team. And now she's the head of our overall customer support for all our customers. Um, and wow. that's a great success and, and, and for, right. for, for everybody, honestly speaking. So I think that's obviously that's an example. That's not going to happen with everybody. But, you know, it's that enabling people to learn, to grow and, and to become better, uh, better professionals in whatever they decide to do. All right. Well, thank you. We'll leave it at that. I really appreciate you coming on, Nicholas. For people that want to learn more about Penn Brothers, where's the best place to send them? Um, well, our webpage or LinkedIn, obviously. Um, okay. And yeah, and I'm always here to help, always here to be reached out to. I'm happy to, happy to be contacted directly. Uh, no problem whatsoever in that. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. We'll put all those links down in the show notes. Thank and you. other than that... Um, Really appreciate you being here, and uh, we will see uh, everyone else in the next one. Thank you very Thanks much. Lot.